Hello YouTubers, nice to see you again. I haven't been making any videos lately uh, because I just haven't had much time for it. Um, trying out the new iPad Air for this recording and have moved out to my living room where I keep a uh, major part of my record collection. Uh, so <clears throat> what's the purpose of this video? Well, one purpose is to um, um, talk about the fact that this year, 19, no, sorry, 2013, it's 30 years since I bought my first record. Uh, and I was eight years old then, and I don't remember which month it was, so I can't say that it was December 1983. Um, so, but at least it was 1983, so I know that it was 30 years ago, and soon we'll have a new year, so. I should really make this video now before it's too late to talk about 30 years. Uh, I remember the occasion when I bought this record. Uh, I remember the store, I remember the record. Um, I mean, I wasn't a very cool child. I didn't listen to the current youth-oriented pop music, nor was I really interested in anything non-commercial or very arty. I was eight years old, so I liked the records that were played at my home by my mother on the trusty old Dux DX 46, uh, 4681 record player. Uh, and well, what was played there? Well, Elvis Presley, Portrait of Music, um, Simon and Garfunkel, Bookends, Johnny Cash at San Quentin, uh, and some other lovely artists. So. I got some good musical ideas from home from the very start. Um, I also got the Swedish dance band music from my grandparents who played records with dance bands like Viking Ara, uh, Flamingo Kvitetten, and Ingmar Nordströms. Uh, the last group mentioned was the first group that I started to listen to more actively since I like the saxophone choir based sound uh, that they produced. Uh, a bit like a Swedish answer to Billy Vaughan, if you remember him. Um, one day my childminder had bought one of the records, Sax Party 8, uh, that was released and recorded in 1981. And I told her that, that I really liked it, and she told me that, well, she had bought it at a local supermarket, just a minute's walk away from where she lived, uh, for just 10 kronor, which is around a dollar fifty cent. Uh, and that there were more copies for sale there. So my mother provided me with te a 10 kronor note, and I went to the store and bought it. And that was the first time that I went to store and bought a record. Previously, my mother had bought, well, records with, well, children records to me, um, but I never walked into a store myself and bought a record. So that was the start, and that was sometime in 1983, although I cannot remember exactly when. Right. Uh, so, that was the start. Um, but apart from listening to my mum's record collection and listening to records at my grandparents' house, I listened to children records, of course. And I'm going to show you very quickly three favorites from my childhood. First, uh, Anita and Televinken. Anita was this girl, woman. Televinken was the doll. And um, they made. Uh, they were a bit of TV stars back in the 60s and 70s, and they were still on television in the early 80s when I remember that. Um, so, and we talk, I listen a lot to records with uh, uh, some other TV stars, named the dolls um, Drutten and Krokodilen, Jena. Or these were originally Russian dolls called Cheborashka and Jena, although uh, the, Swede, the script was totally Swedish. Uh, and they were played by the two late TV uh, music personalities, Agneta Bolmeborg and 
the Sting Carbide. And also, I listened to the dramatizations of the Belgian cartoon um, um, books uh, about the Belgian journalist Tintin or Tintin. And there were Swedish um, dramatizations made that were very good, very well made, um, with great actors. And my favorite was uh, the actor Åke Lindström who played uh, Captain Haddock. And this is one of their albums, Castafiores Juveler. I don't know the English or French uh, title for this, but the jewelry, jewelry of the Castafiore, uh, the opera singer. This is like a comedy, really comedy album, because the great performance of the actors and also the opera singer Kerstin Dellert, who played the Castafiore. Right, well, anyway. That was 1983, and I just discovered the glory of fine records. 1988, that was 25 years ago. I was 13 years old back then, I just entered the horrid teenage years. I was still listening to a lot to these dance band albums, although I didn't really talk that loud about it, because, well, not really cool, not really cool, might have been mocked. Uh, I had the weird idea that I was too old for children records, although you can never be too old for children records, so I got rid of major part of uh, my uh, children record collection, and that was stupid. <laughs> and I've been spending a lot of time to <laughs> get those back since then, uh, other copies of the same albums. I still haven't found all the records I had. Uh, I mean, that was really idiotic. Um, but. I listened a lot to comedy albums at this time, mainly Swedish ones, uh, like albums with a legendary comedian, musician and songwriter Paul Rammel. This was the first album I bought. It was uh, Vid Pianot, Paul Rammel, P. Rammel, from 1971. Bought it in 1985, probably. And also... Um, uh, the recorded stage shows by the Swedish comedy duo Hans Alfredsson and Tony Danielsson. Um, many of the uh, albums with their improvised Lindemann numbers. This is one example. Lindemann Gorian. Right. Um, but I also discovered some albums with Monty Python. This was the first one I found and it was the first album. Uh, Monty Python's Flying Circus from 1970 on BBC, on the BBC label, and this compilation with the material from the Charisma label, uh, the final ripoff, very gruesome label, uh, sorry, the sleeve, from 1987. Um, and also some uh, soundtracks from the popular comedy series. Forty Towers. This is one of them. Um, and I remember at, at, at this time I didn't have any video device for uh, playing recorded uh, videos. At, I, mean, I didn't have any VHS or VCR or anything. And Monty Python and uh, Forty Towers weren't actually broadcasted that often in Swedish television at this time, believe it or not. <clears throat> Uh, and I noticed that, that my English improved quite a lot uh, at this time before, because I found a very good reason to try to understand English, I mean to get all the jokes on these albums, so that was good. Two years earlier I had had my big awakening when it comes to music appreciation when I bought Paul Simon's Graceland. I've been talking many times about this album in my uh, YouTube channel, so I'm not going to nag on about it today. But I meant to buy it for my mother originally, but I because I, she likes Paul Simon, I like Paul Simon. Um, uh, but I realized that it was I listened to this much more. I, I listened um, with my Sennheiser headphones uh, at the Fisher stereo system that had replaced the Ducks some years later every night for several weeks, and th that album, this album, really woke up my curiosity for different kinds of music. 
And in 1987, I saw a documentary about the fact that it was 20 years since the Beatles recorded uh, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So I decided to buy that album. Unless you don't know what it looks like. Uh, <laughs> and I liked it from the very beginning. So, in other words, my musical taste development had started at this time by exploring the best. Well, 1993, 20 years ago, I was in my late teens and during these years I mainly bought CDs. From the early 90s to the late 90s I bought mainly CDs. I hadn't really started calling myself a record collector yet. That happened in 1994, I think. Uh, that was when I first started buying second-hand vinyl. Uh, after I bought a fairly cheap but good Sony turntable and a very nice Sony receiver together with the speakers that used to belong to the Fisher stereo system. In the early 90s, 1990s I listened a lot to Elvis Costello, here represented by Might Like Rose from 1991. And I listened to this, well, it wasn't CD then, I bought the vinyl later. and. Uh, I was greatly influenced by him when I wrote my own songs and I listened also a lot to the Swedish folk punk group Trasten in Dels Quintet. This is their third album, Jolly Bob Gorillan from 1991. I'm sure I showed this in the channel before as well. Um, yeah. In 1998, it feels so close but it was 15 years ago, I had left my childhood home and I was taking various courses before I, after some time, decided to study to become a teacher. Uh, I had the year before, in 1997, bought my first real quality turntable. It was a Rega Planar II. Um, during these years I had realized, uh, realized the magic of jazz music and it started with a rather worn copy of the Atomic Mr. Basie. This is a newer and better copy, but it's not the same copy. Uh, I started listening to lots of different jazz, recorded up until the early 60s, with some few exceptions later. Um, I still really can't enjoy free-form jazz, but I like good fusion. And in the late 1990s, I discovered the Canadian singer and songwriter Ron Sexsmith, here represented by Blue Boy from 2001. I first heard of him when Elvis Costello mentioned him in an interview that I read, and I later when I heard a live concert with him on Swedish radio. I was amazed by the quality of his songwriting, and I have been a great fan and admirer of him ever since. Once when I paid him a compliment on his website, I got a long and friendly personal reply from him, and where he talked about how much he loved playing in Sweden, and that he hoped that he would be back soon. I mean, that strengthens the admiration. A man that's very down to earth, very, hum very humble. And also, in 1998, <laughs> that was the year when I bought an old Philips battery gramophone with the option to play two, uh, 78 RPM records and, and a pile of old 78 RPM records. And voila, I now also was a 78 RPM collector. In 2003, that was 10 years ago, I was studying to become a teacher and I had two years left before I could would graduate and in early 2000 a female student friend made me interested in American uh, roots music and blues and I explored and listened a lot to uh, that during these years, especially the early blues, the so called country blues uh, and I picked out here an album with Blind Blake to represent that. Uh, I also started listening to the Canadian group The Band. I was introduced to their music uh, by a music interested neighbor back in the early 1990s, but I wasn't really ready for it back then. But during the early years of the 21st century, um, the albums of the band were played over and over at my place. Well, mainly these two, of course. Music from Big Pink and the band, of course. And since I was very much into the band, uh, 
at this time and still is <laughs> it was obvious that I would start showing interest uh, in Bob Dylan when I and when I turned 30 back in 1990 no sorry 2004 uh, I finally started listening to Bob Dylan I hadn't been too impressed by him uh, earlier since I grew up with his 80s music and that didn't really help I started listening to his song when other artists uh, made covers of them and I finally realized how good the lyrics were. This was one of the albums that I listened a lot to with many good um, covers of Bob Dylan, the best of Odetta. Uh, so, but when I was 30 years old I was old enough to really uh, be able to enjoy and admire the music of Bob Dylan. And this collection here, Bob Dylan Greatest Hits, was one of the first Dylan albums that I got. And in 2004 I was also lucky to uh, be able to buy a, a, a second-hand Lenko 950 stereo system with a built-in receiver and a Lenko uh, L78 turntable. It was originally bought back in 1971 but it was in superb shape and still works fine to this date. By the year of 2008, I had received my master's degree in education and was now working as a teacher. I had moved to Stockholm in 2006 and started a new life all in all. I had slimmed down the record collection, but it took, still took, it took some years to bring the whole collection down to Stockholm. Um, moving to Stockholm was amazing for me in many ways, because, but one thing was the fact that I now had lots of record stores to explore and of course the record collection grew again and now it's bigger than ever before yeah uh, yeah it is really <clears throat> still not out of control though looks quite neat doesn't it right uh, during these years I, I was getting more and more in a rockier mood I told you I wasn't cool at all when I was a kid and I was going to become a bit more rockier mm -hmm. Uh, so I listen a lot to Rolling Stones. I, I hadn't been too keen on Rolling Stones before because I I, I thought Mick Jagger was annoying. I, I still think he's annoying, but but I've been able to ignore that and enjoy the music. And one of my favorite records and that I bought and listened to a lot uh, during these years was um, Let It Bleed. This one. Well, <laughs> 2013. It's difficult to look back at something so close in time, especially since the year 2013 hasn't finished yet when recording this. Uh, I can mention though that since 2008 I've started this YouTube channel. I started it in 2010, in February. And it's been a great help and inspiration, not just because it's raised my knowledge about music from all over the world. I also have the pleasure of getting to know other record collectors all over the world. And that, if anything, is a blessing. The last five years have been quite focused on music that can be described as progressive. Well, we can take the Swedish group Kebnekaise as an example of that. Uh, it's one of the bands I've started collecting during the last four or five years. I've started buying uh, Swedish progressive pop and rock and last couple of years explored the British prog scene, American and, well, European prog scene too, more and more. And I also listened more to the early hard rock, like, well, Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin. Uh, yeah. And the latest, well, not last, I can assure you, albums I bought are these Light in the Attic uh, reissues by Rodriguez. And uh, very good stuff. Uh, check Searching for Sugar Man. That's one of the best music documentaries I've seen for many years. And hopefully I will make a new video in 2018 celebrating 35 years as a record buyer collector. Or maybe a 40 year anniversary in 2023. Who knows? Well, anyway, we'll deal with that when that happens. Thank you for watching. <laughs>